Okay, so our next session is Rob Neary and Phil Sato. Uh, they will be talking about technical things regarding the Tesla Model S mostly, I think. So we're going to be the more geeky uh, part of the presentation this afternoon. We, we know with the TMC forum crowd, there's, a, there's definitely a technical part to everyone's interest. So uh, my, my half is a little less technical. I think Phil's got a bit, a bit, uh, quite a bit more detail than I do. Um, but I, uh, so, I'm, uh, so I'm an owner for three years now, and I kind of decided for, the, for, this, for this half or this portion to start out with this view of, you know, you're an owner of a car for three years. What, is, what, is, what do we do after three years with the car? Um, so I, I also, for anyone who's here last year, I presented last year. This is just a basic introduction to me. Uh, geek from the 80s, computer guy, car geek, and I started out with an Active E is, uh, before I had uh, Model S. Uh, I got into electric cars through that program, BMW's uh, prototype program for their drivetrain. So Active E led me to Model S because Active E is a 50, 60 mile car and it wasn't practical for my needs. But you really like the paint job. Oh yes, yes, that would be, that would be the uh, <laughs> graphics from the Active E that I put onto my Tesla, <laughs> which you'll see out in the parking lot and later tonight if you're there. Um, so again, the, the theme for my little section here is basically you have a three-year-old car. So I have this thing I tell people about cars that are three years old, and that's that there's two kind of things I found in my ownership experience. One is that at three years, you typically are at the stage where you've scraped it once or twice. You're ready to maybe do a little creative stuff, modify the inside, modify the outside, and the market pressure around two to three years is when all the aftermarket stuff starts to come out. So replacement lights, ground effects, uh, anyone who, who has an early model car will know tires and rims were impossible to get the first couple of years or first year. And then all of that stuff, slowly the market kind of reacts to, hey, we have this new car we need to supply parts to. Um, so that's, that's what the, the theme is. And then I also, again from last year, have this, this hot rotting uh, theme, which leads well into, uh, into fill section. So we'll talk about it that at the end. Um, oh, and the other one, just real quickly, is the out-of-warranty maintenance. That's something I am just starting to deal with. So one of the upgrades I did to my car two years ago was a stereo upgrade, and there were a couple of just simple lessons I learned I wanted to share with people. Uh, center channel is where all of your audio effects come through, so don't put an amplifier on your center channel or your turn signal will now be 100 decibels, and you'll want to rip that amplifier out the day you get it. <laughs> um, this, this is still true as far as I know, uh, but I did learn something new from Phil when we were talking, which is that on my car, we didn't uh, have a line level out that we knew about, so we actually took uh, Amplified out and then we had to squash it to put it into a powered amp. Um, and there are multiple ways to deal with this in BMWs and Mercedes. A lot of times they'll use a DSP, that, a digital signal processor that takes powered in, flattens the equalizer and sends it out line level. Um, but the, the the, uh, the, the head unit actually does have a line level out, which Phil was sharing. Um, the second part to this that was important is that the amplified out on the car is not flat. So if you like sound and you like to modify your sound and you're taking powered out for your speakers, that's not a flat audio curve. There is pre-amplification in that. So my stereo guy last year started talking to me about using one of these to uh, flatten out the curve so then you can do stuff with it after. Um, and there's plenty of, of solutions for this now. Hardware, as you probably all know, gets cheaper every six months. So this is an example. There's two or three DSPs uh, that do that function. Um, some interesting things I learned from my 50,000 mile service. So one of them was uh, every time you change the tires on a car with an air suspension, they actually re-level it. So there's a, it's not, you don't just swap the tires on a car with an active suspension like this. There's a a technical step that has to be done, and it was causing me to burn out rear tires both because of the negative camber and because it was, it was not adjusted properly. Um, so I learned that the hard way after burning through three sets of tires in two years. Um, <laughs> the second thing I learned that was interesting is that the coolant system, when they swap the coolant at this service, they, um, the way they get the air out of the system is they tell the computer to run a test loop on the circuit, and it knows when there's air bubbles in the loop. So this is an example of how if you want to service your own car, or you want to communicate, basically do stuff with one of these modern cars, um, there's software involved, and the software is key to the service process. So unless someone creates software, or you hack your way in, or Tesla provides software, this is where we're going to start to see a change in do-it-yourself anything on these cars, um, which the GT series, I'm sure, ran into trying to do cooling. 
Um, and this was just a, just a practical thing I ran into, I figured I would highlight. Um, another thing that a lot of people may know or may not know, the Tesla site, Tesla services, this is the same uh, service site that the techs use in the shop. So they offer this site up to the public. Two caveats. Uh, one is that free access gives you basically technical service bulletins and that's it. So if you want to see if there's a recall or something that's an internal recall or an internal bulletin, you can sign into the site, create an account, not pay anything and get that information and all manufacturers offer that. But um, in some states where, like Massachusetts, where they, they have this kind of right to repair stuff, there's a new thing where they have to give you all of the service data. I want my service manual. We're still kind of in the middle with, they'll give you the service manual, but they won't give you the service software. So you can't do everything the techs in the shop do, but we're getting there. And as more states have that, um, in that kind of legal framework to say, hey, Mr. Manufacturer, you have to allow people to work on their own cars, you'll probably see more of this, and I think Tesla will probably offer more to the public. Um, and then the last part, which I again highlighted last year, is really around my kind of pet project. So two to three years after the fact, there's a few things you see in the market. You'll see parts, like um, we now have a company that's gonna make this uh, upgraded facelift bumper. That's, I think, uh, I think they're doing pre-orders right now. Um, and there's a handful of you know, other ground effects and things that are available for the car, body kits and other things. Um, but also, cars get wrecked. So six months after the car came out, wrecked cars were available. So we've had two years now for people to actually rip cars apart and reverse engineer or tinker. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so wrecked cars are the beginning of the tuner market. It's when people who want to race a car, build a car, hack a car, um, you know, what hot rodders used to do 75 years ago, this is now becoming a thing for electric cars. And there's two things you need to know to do this. One is you gotta have the parts, and two is you have to have all the software stuff. So Tesla, beyond any other car right now, is a very software-centric car. Everything talks to each other. And the protocol is CAN. Uh, there's lots of detail on this, which is, well, there's more of with Phil. Um, but the thing I wanted to highlight here is that even in the time that the Model S has been out, CAN has changed. So the plugs you see here, the lower one is what I have on my early car. The later one is the one that has all the autopilot and all the new features in it. So they've added multiple additional CAN buses to the car for all that data. So there's just a, a massive amount of data in the car. And where that figures in is that if you want to do anything with these salvage parts, you need to be able to talk to them. So the motor won't spin without being talked to. The charger won't work without being talked to. The motor controller, um, so everything in the car talks over that network, over the multiple CAN networks. So from a, I want to build a kit car with a Tesla motor in it because it's pretty much the best motor I could find for a car. This is where you go from just, you know, the old days of an engine and drilling out the head and, or drilling out the cylinders and putting, you know, mechanical things on it to I need to understand how the software works. I need to know why the motor won't turn, you know, how to make it turn, how to unlock things. And this is the beginning of, I would say, kind of street hot rodding for electric cars. Um, GT is another example of how that happens, but from the, you know, I don't have, $250,000, $300,000 to spend on ripping apart a Tesla and race readying it, this is the other end. That's a $10,000 kit car. I can get a crashed motor for not much. I can put together a battery pack on my own and then you bodge together the pieces and you can build your own electric street rod. So that's where kind of my low level technical stuff and ends and Phil uh, has a little more. <laughs> yeah. Um the car is uh, unlike any other car that I've ever seen, and including things like even jet aircraft, the car is instrumented to the hilt. Um, it generates and processes more data than any other uh, transportation device I've ever had experience with. Um, and yes, uh, servicing the cars without access to this is uh, very difficult, if not impossible. As you all know, um, if you've had any problems with your car, you uh, end up with a call Tesla service. Car may not restart. In, you have to call Tesla to get that information. So um, I started by buying a, a, a 70 new about a year ago. I've wanted one for a while, but it was hard to justify spending that much for a car. But I did. And as soon as I got it home, I tore it apart. <laughs> <laughs> not something that most people will do. And, you know, 
It's just, it, it's just what I do. So after a few months of learning about the car, I felt confident that I could tackle a salvage. Uh, and I did, and it was easy. And I said, this was easy, I'm going to do it again. So I bought a second one. That one wasn't so easy. <laughs> but I, I kept learning, and uh, I've been through seven cars now. Um, and now I'm done with that. I've got two decent cars, one for my wife, one for me. And now I'm helping other people do it, um, because there's a lot of salvage cars out there. And unfortunately, there's a whole bunch of people that do this for a living. They go to insurance auctions, mm -hmm. they buy the cars, they try to repair them, and they're finding out they can't even get the cars to go again, even with relatively minor damage. And of course, the cars are also being totaled for relatively minor damage. So they get auctioned, and uh, these guys buy them, and they can't fix them, so they go, they go as parts. So you can get on eBay and buy all manner of parts, which is good because if you have a salvage car, Tesla won't sell you parts for it. Uh, that's just their policy. I, I hope they change it. But uh, I was getting into, uh, you know, I want to get into some of the technical stuff. I'll just gloss over this because we don't have a lot of time. But these are some of the acronyms that, you, that Tesla uses. And once you get access to the service information, it'll be full of these acronyms. Like it'll say, you know, uh, D-A-S-M-I-A. And you don't know what that is. It means the autopilot's not present. So there's a whole bunch of these. Uh, at some point, I'll publish them. This is just a, a little view under the frunk once you take out all the plastic there. Um, there's a lot of parts in this car. The, the electric drivetrain is relatively simple and has few moving parts. But there's a lot of systems in the car. And just supporting the electronics, there's four cooling pumps, for example. Um, all the extra parts, like the air suspension, there's a complex valve body. You've got a compressor, a reservoir. Um, starting with the autopilot cars, they imp implemented a, a new electrohydraulic brake booster that's really neat. Um, and all these things talk on a total of six CAN buses in the car. And uh, CAN, for those that don't know, is, stands for Controller Area Network. It's just a, it's a really basic computer network that's really robust and can survive in a car uh, and work reliably, uh, unlike most computer networks. So it's been used, uh, I think, since pretty much since the 80s. And it's the dominant way for all the devices in a car uh, to talk together. So once you get access, to, uh, let me go back uh, and t tell you one more thing. Uh, in the car, there's, there's two Linux computers and a, a, com a, a separate computer called a gateway. And the gateway is kind of the heart. The gateway talks to every device in the car. And it also acts as the gatekeeper to isolate parts of the car, like you don't want a problem with your climate control breaking the drive unit. So those sit apart, but they might need to know data. You know, So the gateway transfers that data back and forth. The other thing the gateway does is it allows the software updates. So the gateway is what knows how to unlock all the ECUs in the car and send the data out and flash the car. So uh, that brings us to this. I, I want to touch on this because I get asked a lot of questions about it. Everyone here knows that you know, the update process is uh, shrouded in mystery. Some cars get it, some don't. There's all this folklore. You know, if I open the door and close it really fast, sometimes I get a software update. You know, <laughs> I've heard all kinds of things. Uh, there's one, there is one thing that Tesla's doing now. If you enter a Tesla service facility, any Tesla service facility, um, they'll push an update to your car if there's one ready for your car. So it won't always work, but if you're really itching for a new update, you can go. All you have to do is drive into a Tesla service center for about five minutes. And when you do that, the car sends a message to Tesla saying, enter Tesla facility. And it sends the facility ID. And this is from a database in the, in the SID. And then Tesla service, lo, ser servers look to see if there's a software update. And then they push it to your car. And this touches on this process here, how the updates work. Uh, it's pretty complicated. Um, I don't think we have enough time for me to fully go over this, and, uh, but I'll be happy to talk to people afterwards if you have any questions. And at this point, I want to take it to questions uh, and see if, if I can answer any questions. Uh, friend and I, we have salvage, we like to call it recycling Tesla cars, <laughs> given with almost no damage, but Tesla won't sell its parts, so like, I'm looking for a radiator right now on one, and it's really hard finding some of these parts. Is there any recommendations for how to get yeah. some of these things? Things like radiators are so fragile, like every car that gets hit in the front loses a radiator. Um, 
it, it is difficult to find one of those, but uh, there's other options too. If you can't, if you've been looking and you can't find one, you can go to some uh, places can recore the radiator. It has plastic tanks, but those can be removed, and they can actually repair it and put it back together. It's probably going to cost more than the radiator would cost from Tesla, no but at least you have an option. The car that I'm driving now, I couldn't find a radiator for when I first uh, got it, so I put a piece of PVC in there, <laughs> and uh, it drove without a radiator. And you know, I live. I'm in driving mine without one right now in Phoenix, Arizona, where it's 110. So <laughs> you know, just don't go very far. <laughs> Phoenix is pushing it, but yeah, you can you can do it. And if you get the uh, the air conditioning system fixed, you can do a, you know you can use that to cool the car too. Just jam the chiller bypass valve open. Yeah, have you seen too where you can root the controller and then you get access to all the maintenance menus and all those codes are decoded? Yeah, what so I'm showing up here, and it's gotten cut it. off uh, by our uh, resolution, this is a data dump from the car. And you wouldn't believe how much data is there. Um, once you do get access to the internals of the car, you can dump this data. And you also, once you're in diagnostic mode, uh, you get all the canonical error messages. So it'll say, call Tesla service, and then underneath in parentheses, it'll say, drive invert or fault or whatever. <laughs> um, so I'm hoping that Tesla will open this up to owners. Um, but I know how to do it. I, you don't ask me to do it on your car, because I have to touch the car to do it. But once we get into the car, then you're permanently into it. And it doesn't affect the car's ability to, you know, for Tesla to service it or whatever. I've also, um, for cars that are salvaged and have no Tesla support, I can provide support, including a remote access app that lets you, you know, control the car, read all the error codes, and things like that. So if, uh, if you are one of these guys with an unsupported car, talk to me later, and we'll, we'll talk about ways to, to help get some of your sanity back. <laughs> So you may have just answered my question. Um, the log files, which Tesla looks at to see what's wrong with your car or after you've had an accident. So I gather you know how to look at them. Uh, some of them. Uh, there's, a, there's a number of logging sources in the car. The gateway uh, logs low-level information at high speed to an SD card. Um, and that log is compressed and tokenized. And I've, I've made uh, headway decoding some of it but not all of it. Mm -hmm. And then the, the SID, the center display, also logs stuff. Those logs are easier to read. Uh, most of them you know, are not compressed, and you can glean a lot from it. But you also don't really need the logs, because the car has such good diagnostics. You, when something goes wrong, you just need an instantaneous, what's wrong with the car? Mm -hmm. And my mobile app gives you that. You, you just pull it up on your phone. It'll give you all the alerts. and. Uh, you know, okay. you can, but that's not something you can easily give everybody. Not, you... No, not yet. And if I did give it out, Tesla would probably figure out how I was giving it out. And if they didn't yell at me, they might figure out a way to shut it off. So, yeah, uh, kind of like the Ethernet port the first time around when exactly. that got hacked. Right. So. Uh, okay. <laughs> they, they've, they've steadily shown us that they don't want us in there, um, unfortunately. Uh, in order for them to become mass market with the Model 3, they're going to have to open it up. And also, a lot of us are having uh, Model S's that are coming off warranty soon. So, you know, I think we're going to have to get the pitchforks out if they don't do something. I think they will. <laughs> you know, any other questions? The uh, center display, if you press the T and hold it, you press the center display and hold it, it up comes a... You get a password box, yes. Has anyone figured out what the password is or how to figure the, out what the password the is? The password rolls every 24 hours. The, the car picks a new password and tells I'll Tesla servers uh, what that is. Um, it's a four-digit password, and it, it's the numbers 0 through 9 and A through F. So you got 24 hours to try uh, <laughs> a lot. But uh, yeah, so, once you root the car, you can get access to those yeah, codes so and enter it. This is a reason you want to backdoor your way in so that you have access and you don't have to worry about any of that. Just so this is, this is the challenge we were talking about last year, where they've got their service software that they can get in with, but there isn't any, uh, there isn't any publicly available option, unlike like on a Volkswagen where you've got the, uh, there's a Volkswagen alternate to the, the factory software. So I think as we as a community kind of grow and Tesla doesn't give us stuff, that's what's going to end up happening is we'll either have our own solution or they'll give us access. I think they're going to give us access. It, it, you know, from the rumblings I hear, they're trying to package their software to something sanitized that they can let out. 
Um, but a lot of, like when I first started working on the cars and I didn't know what I know now, like the coolant bleed process, you know, you have to have the magic software, but I figured out a way around it. You, you can pull the BMS fuse and plug it back in and the <laughs> pumps go into high and then take a shot back and put it on the reservoir and suck all the bubbles out. <laughs> no computer needed. Yeah. <laughs> so th there's lots of workarounds like that. <laughs> Hey, can you guys speak a little bit about how the car interacts with the supercharger? Are there any uh, nefarious things Tesla's doing as you're supercharging? Are they recording your charging? Are they limiting and throttling you? or anything Your like VIN that? is your access to the network. So, well, you, yeah, so, so basically when, you're, when you plug into the network, the car tell, sends its VIN, and the VIN is how you get authorized on that network. The, the reason I think they're doing that is probably because they're going to license the supercharging if people want to use it. So you need, you need a user ID of some sort so that they can, they can deal with that in the future. Uh, is there anything more than that? I, well, I want to correct you a bit. Uh, oh. the, the car does send the VIN to the supercharger, and they do log the superchargers, but you can send any VIN. Ah. You could send a VIN from a Volkswagen. It doesn't care. <laughs> um, what, what controls access to the supercharger is the car. Mm -hmm. So on a lot of the salvage cars that have had black, blacklisting, removing support, they actually turn off supercharging. Uh, before they disconnect from the car. Um, it, you could turn it back on, and if you have a car that's been turned off, as long as I feel your high voltage system isn't gonna burst into flames, <laughs> and I think that's why they do it, we can turn it back on. Because if it's a paid for, I'm not gonna do anything to cheat Tesla out of money. So if you didn't pay for supercharging, I'm not gonna turn it on, but if your car had it and it was paid for, we can turn it back on. They, that, there's a legitimate safety concern for that, yeah. so. I can see why they'd want to do it. So there's no back and forth. You send the VIN up, but there's no just, authorization back. No, okay. the car the car makes that decision. Very cool. They could change it. Yeah, you know, well, but they don't. You know. Yeah, so we'll see. The software software subject to change. <laughs> yeah. Question: Have you tried adding autopilot to a, an autopilot not available? Uh, you know, one of the earlier cars, and also have you been able to tap into the raw okay. sensors like yeah. radar and uh, the cameras used, like mobile eye cameras? Uh, I haven't uh, added autopilot to a car. I looked at what was entailed in doing it, and I said, "This isn't. It isn't worth it because you can just buy a salvage car that has it, you know, and sell your existing one and fix that one." Uh, WK057 uh, Jason on the forums, he did it to his wife's P85, and I think it cost him nine thousand dollars and probably 500 hours of labor, but he did it. Uh, it is doable, but you have to change so much. Uh, the, like the windshield, like half the wiring harnesses in the car, the entire braking system. It's, it's not just a camera, you know, and all the sensors are different. And to answer the second part of your question, yes, uh, the, you can access the radar data. Um, I haven't fully decoded it, but I have a lot of it. And you can also access the Bosch uh, ultrasonic data. But the camera is kind of a bit of a mystery. I know that in an accident, it records still frames of the accident uh, for later analysis, really small ones, not a lot of data. But getting video out of that, no. Um, and getting like, things like you know, extra data about the environment, no. It, I don't know if that would take a lot of effort. If you guys, uh, if anyone wants to geek out and do this more, I think after the Auto Museum tour, uh, which is after the supercharger opening uh, ceremony tomorrow, we're going to all congregate somewhere, and then we can just do whatever. So if you're interested in that, there you go. And I guess that's it. Thanks, Doug. Thank you. Let's all uh, thank Rob and Phil. Go ahead.